I was asked to be uh, as brief as possible, so I will stop the uh, uh, greetings here and I'll go right to my argument. My argument here is that Moroccan foreign policy <clears throat> is uh, a pragmatic foreign policy. It takes into consideration mainly the uh, global and the regional balance of power in order to uh, establish, to defend what it uh, has defined as its uh, as the national interest. Uh, so, I will not go into the details of how the national interest is defined. Uh, I am part of a school that believes that you know, the national interest is not a given. It is uh, socially constructed. So, I will not go into that. This is an academic discussion. Here, I will go directly to the point. In order to make my point, I will have three cases and a caveat. Uh, the three cases are the uh, one is pre uh, pre Mohammed VI uh, reign. It's the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Soviet Union, and uh, the new uh, <coughs> geostrategic. Uh, balance of power that was uh, that became the order of the day after the end of the Cold War. The second case I will uh, discuss very briefly is the post-9-11 terrorist attacks against the United States. And the third uh, case is the um, migration uh, of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to, uh, to Europe and they end up stopping and some of them, many of them are increasingly staying in Morocco and the consequences of that on Moroccan foreign policy. The caveat is I'm speaking here only about the big powers and as uh, you mentioned in your question uh, there is a, a major reorientation of Moroccan foreign policy over the last few years. Morocco is looking increasingly towards the south uh, towards Latin America and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the caveat. So let's go to the first point. The first, the first case. The first case is um, the end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War represented a major challenge to Moroccan foreign policy since Morocco was uh, Clearly, a uh, Western ally. Uh, clearly, uh, although Morocco is part of the non-aligned movement, Morocco is, was a clearly Western ally. It had strong links with the U.S., with France. With the end of the Cold War, there was a major concern among Moroccan decision, foreign uh, policy decision makers, that this would have a major impact and that would uh, diminish the interest of the West uh, in, in Morocco. So. Um, what happened was uh, by destiny, by chance, you call it as you wish, but Saddam Hussein decided to invade uh, Kuwait and then Morocco sent troops to Saudi Arabia. Morocco was one of the first countries to send troops to Saudi Arabia. Um, Moroccan troops were not under General Schwarzkopf's command. They were not part of, uh, uh, of Desert Storm, but Moroccan troops were present in Saudi Arabia and Morocco uh, was uh, and then Morocco embarked into all the efforts that started taking place at that moment, including uh, the, the Madrid Peace uh, uh, Middle East Peace Conference that directly and or indirectly ended up resulting in the Oslo peace process. So this means that Morocco, uh, and that allowed, for instance, Morocco to host uh, an economic uh, summit in Casablanca, uh, a Middle East su uh, summit in Casablanca, which means that Morocco uh, played the role of the re its regional localization and the, re the, the role it plays uh, as a moderate Arab state in, uh, uh, with the West in order to tell the West, well, you can still rely on us, we are a, f uh, a faithful and strong and a, re a reliable ally. Um, Morocco used another card uh, in the 1990s and that's the card of uh, contributing significantly to peacekeeping operations. So Morocco sent troops to Congo, Morocco sent troops to Haiti, Morocco sent troops to Kosovo. Morocco is uh, one of the major contributors uh, to peacekeeping operations around the world and this enhances the, the fact that Morocco plays the game and contributes to the global institutions and Morocco is uh, a trustworthy ally. So 
This is how Morocco adapted uh, its strategy to defend, to stand for its national interest right after these major changes, the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. So this is the first case. Second case, 9-11. 9-11 and, so, and how would uh, a very small country like Morocco react? Morocco reacted very quickly, very swiftly. Uh, the attacks were on Tuesday. On Saturday, the whole Moroccan government was at uh, St. Peter's Cathedral in, pa in Rabat. All of them were for uh, a collective uh, mass uh, rem in remembering the victims of 9-11 uh, attacks. Uh, Morocco mainly, this is from the symbolic point of view, from the effective point of view, Morocco uh, 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 acted against ter uh, potential terrorist groups and ter terrorist groups established in Morocco a couple of years after that, right after w when Morocco was hit also by terrorist attacks in Casablanca, Morocco voted the new uh, anti-terrorist law that was quite that gave the authorities a lot of power in order to pursue uh, the uh, not only the, the terrorist groups or or supposed terrorist groups, but also their financial assets. So uh, Morocco gave itself uh, tools in order to fight terrorism. Morocco also was very active in the active uh, on the active front uh, in support of the United States uh, and in its war against terror. And it's uh, 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 it's enough to say that when Morocco uh, in the signing of the free trade agreement between Morocco and the United States, President Bush uh, mentioned explicitly in his speech that the, the free trade agreement between Morocco and the United States was signed in order to thank Morocco for, the, for its role as a trustworthy and faithful and stable ally. So, because there is a debate about the free trade agreement with the United States, but it's not really, it's not playing the role, the, the, the economic and trade role it could play, but it gave Morocco a major card uh, uh, in the region. Um, it's Morocco also, uh, uh, to prove this uh, way of Morocco co cooperating with the, the, the West in general, the US in particular, in the war against terror. Morocco became an extraordinary uh, NATO ally and Morocco be, uh, is uh, holds on a regular basis uh, military maneuvers with the United States and with NATO on Moroccan territory. So this means that Morocco uh, uh, sets up itself as a major trustworthy and reliable ally in the region. Uh, third case, the third case is the case of the, the migrants. Um, Morocco has decided, took the formal decision that it is in its best interest to cooperate with uh, the European Union and to fight uh, uh, illegal migration to the European Union be it the illegal migration of Moroccans or of non-Moroccans. Um, this has a major cost for Morocco. This has a major cost in many ways. So on the one hand, as uh, uh, Minister Shami said in his presentation, Morocco has been investing heavily in Africa, and Morocco, uh, but at the same, so Morocco has this very positive image in Africa, uh, but Morocco has also, uh, is, under the risk of being the gendarme of Europe. Morocco is stopping potential illegal migrants to cross the Mediterranean and to reach European territories, and this has a major cost for Morocco. This has a major cost because obviously Moroccan police officers are not known for respecting human rights, so they mistreat Moroccans, but they mistreat the, the, the migrants, and it's a major, so uh, we have that issue, and we have also the issue that a lot of these uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africans are literally stuck in Morocco, and many of them have decided to remain in Morocco. They, have, they are building their lives in Morocco, and the National Council on Human Rights has uh, recommended recently over the summer that Moroccan laws of uh, migration, uh, sh migrants should be treated differently and that Morocco should uh, have more, uh, uh, should, uh, as it praises 
is itself of being hospitable. Morocco should be hospitable to these migrants and to build laws and, and infrastructure in order to be hospitable to these migrants. Um, so this, is, this was the third case. Uh, as I said in my introduction, all these have been only mainly speaking about Western Europe and the United States. There is a caveat, and there is, because there is a major move in Moroccan foreign policy over the last few years, um, and this move uh, saw uh, the king uh, visiting several Latin American countries uh, in the previous decade. Uh, it saw Morocco playing a major role in the first summit uh, of South American and uh, Arab states in 2005 in Brasilia and the second summit was going to be held in Morocco, it didn't happen, but uh, the intention was there, it was to play a major role in this rapprochement between South, South America and the Arab world. Uh, Morocco is heavily invested in, in Africa, as uh, Minister Shani said, Morocco is the second inv African investor in the African continent. Moroccan trade with Africa uh, 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 was raised by 500% over the last few years. 500%. It was ridiculous a few years ago, but now it is becoming a substantial trade. Uh, 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 there is a substantial level of trade. Um, so Morocco is looking uh, towards Africa. Obviously, Morocco is developing and strengthening its links with, uh, with China, although that's not specifically the doing of Morocco. That Morocco has established the free trade agreement with Turkey, and Turkey became a major trade partner of Morocco. So Morocco is strengthening and diversifying its partnerships and working on ways to defend its national interests or what it has defined as its national interest, but through different ways and not only through relying exclusively on the European, uh, on its links with the European Union and uh, the United States. I think I will stop here and we'll wait for questions. Thank mm. you very much.